Hello, wherever you are in the world today, welcome to Beyond the Art in our series, The Stories That Carry Us. I'm your host, Craig Beaumont Flynn, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and the Delaware Tribe of Indians. In each episode, we will discuss with various Native American artists, influencers, art leaders, and everyone in between their experiences, the communities they serve, and the translation and interpretation of the Native American art world today. Well, today we have Daniel McCoy, a Potawatomi and Muskogee Creek uh, Nation citizen. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. We're excited to have you on. So why don't you tell us a little about your story? Okay. Well, um, I started off doing art probably as young as I can remember. Um, It was kind of a thing to do um, at the house. Uh, My mother had exquisite art taste. And she also had exquisite music taste. And I think she was, was she frustrated. Artist, well, I think she wanted to be. And I didn't really realize that until recently. She said that at a show. She said, well, I'm the one that wanted to be an artist. And um, <laughs> so I think they just all, all my family, um, everybody did something. And uh, I come from a long background, a seamstress, a really good seamstress. Um, my grandmother, my mom. Uh, my grandfather did a little bit of everything, uh, machinery and upholstery. And then um, and he he was the collector of native art in the family. And it was kind of like a sense of pride. Mm-hmm. We uh, would collect artists nearby. Either they were Creek or Potawatomi. Um, uh, the Tiger family is uh, Jerome Tiger and Johnny Tiger, Woody Crumbo, Joan Hill. Mm-hmm. And then later, Southwestern artists like Pablita Velarde, and then on and on from there. Mm-hmm. And then my dad uh, was a frustrated artist in his own right, and um, he built custom hot rods, uh, custom motorcycles, and was a pinstriper. And so I grew up thinking that like a pinstriping design on the front of a Mercury right. was the same as, like, say, a Waterbird design in an Archie Black Owl. Uh, painting. I had no idea that these come from two different cultures. And when I, when then, you know, when you're young, you just don't realize that. And, right. and so my father was a non-native um, and he was surrounded by Muscogee people pretty much primarily where we grew up at. And so I didn't know that I was mixed blood until I got older. And that was a, a touchy subject uh, and, and kind of tough to grow up around as a kid. But after I got outside of the box and started traveling, um, I realized that it, there wasn't, it, it happens all the time. And now it's more of an accepted thing. But in the 70s, it was kind of rough to be. And, I, and, and that also gave me this feeling that I never really fit in anywhere. And, but the arts, native art is what's taken me and allowed me to fit in everywhere after right. it. So, um, and then that's coming around full circle. Uh, so. But um, I'm a painter, a printmaker. Um, I work in enamels. I'm a muralist. And just about anything in graphics, if I can figure out how to do it, I'll do it. Uh, 3D stuff, I kind of avoid. I wish I was a little bit better at it. But I'm I'm just – my sculptures never turn out quite as good as the paintings. (laughs) Right, right. So what do you feel is your absolute calling? What medium is is the epitome of uh, Daniel McCoy? Um, um, well, I think it's a mix of storytelling and, uh, humor Mm -hmm. that I put in oil painting. I like to cloak, uh, tough subject matter with, um, uh, with humor. Um, so you, you deal with the issue, but you kind of cloak it and, uh, provide these different layers, uh, kind of like an artichoke. Right. You peel back and there's (laughs) still more artichoke, only a little bit stouter. Right. Um, that's how I, I like to describe it, but, uh, oil painting and enamel painting are my strengths. And where, you, where do you get your inspiration? Oh, wow. That's, that comes from everywhere right now. Um, I'm doing, um, it, it started off with comic books, um, cartoons. I wanted to be a, a, a cartoonist for Hanna-Barbera Oh wow! Yeah. or have my own comic strip, like, 
uh, Chester Gould or um, um, Charles Schultz or John Davis, who does, uh, I think that's his name for Garfield. Right. Um, I wanted to have my own comic strip or work for Hanna-Barbera. And then by the time I came of age, I have two cousins that work for Disney. And they told me, oh, we're nobody's even doing anything by hand anymore. So I got really discouraged and kind of changed my uh, – and I thought, well, if I can't get into the and, – and being from Oklahoma, just to even make it out to the coast and any – it just seemed like a, a world away. You're right. It seemed like a different world. And so um, um, Creek, uh, my Creek mother uh, and grandmother – they really wanted me to keep me around, you know, keep me around the house and clip my wings a bit. And so I kind of listened to a little bit too much to them before I really started traveling. Uh, but Indian art gave me uh, just as much experience, if not more so. Uh, so I'm very proud of my hard work. I've been at it for about 32 years now. Started when I was 15. I was going to say you started when you were a baby. <laughs> so do you take a lot of... <laughs> Do you take a lot of your cultural and heritage aspects of being a Native American, Muscogee Creek, and Potawatomi into your artwork? Is it integrated where it's very distinct well, and noticeable? Well, yeah. You know, at first you're just kind of copying what you see. And I mean, mm -hmm. you're always going to be doing that. It's it's a form of osmosis, you know. Um, uh, and, and I would copy a lot of album covers, uh, like lettering a lot, logos. Uh, and, and then... Um, uh, I started participating in um, either our church songs a little bit more. Uh, and then I went to a little small country school called Olive, Oklahoma. And growing up, it was fine, you know, as in elementary. But once we got to uh, middle school age and and uh, puberty kicked in, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're starting to copy the adults that are around us. And people that were my best friends were starting to copy their parents. And uh, I just felt like there was this distinct difference right. between uh, myself and and um, the rest of the student body. And and um, so my spirituality or traditional religions, my dad being a, an ex-Hells Angel, bringing the uh, counterculture in from San Francisco and all those posters – uh, so that kind of brought it in that made me realize I was different than those around me. Right. Um, and, and so I just used that feeling of not fitting in. I didn't know I was doing it at the time, but I used that as a way just to springboard and get off to somewhere else. And then, so I left home, uh, really young and not knowing how to get my art seen. I was copying a lot of the flat style painters, mm -hmm. learning how to use, gouache and pen and ink and then i went to sequoia indian school in tahlequah oklahoma because the only thing to do growing up was to either have a family really young go to the local votech and learn hairdressing carpentry <laughs> or offset printing right. or go into the army and i'm the first eldest man or male in my family to not be affected by one of the wars and so my grandpa and my dad got together. They huddled together and were like, no, you're going to go get your education. And so I'm a product of Indian education. I graduated from an Indian boarding school in Tahlequah, uh, which was run by the BIA, BIA when I first started, later on Cherokee Nation by the end mm -hmm. of it. And then they sent me right out to the Institute of American Indian Arts. And um, I, had a, I studied under a teacher named uh, Mary Adair. And her son is Dan Horsechief. I don't know if you've heard of him. I've known the name, yes. Uh, but, but, but they just, Mary had a way of um, not making me mad, but kind of, <laughs> rat, you know, rattling the cage a little bit. Pushing you, probably. good work would come out of it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, John G. And, and pushing you. Yes, yes. And, and, and I entered every show. Uh, and so we... Before I could travel there, we had our work out in Santa Fe, Herb Museum, uh, further um, east, all these poster contests. And so then we would sell something. Um, that was kind of weird, you know. So for, mm -hmm. so within a really short time, I went from thinking of how am I even going to get my work seen? What do I do? 
Um, and then also there was some other influence at a local shop in Sepulpa, Oklahoma called Mr. Indians. Uh, the owner, Norman, uh, would come and bring me cow skulls to paint, oh, like wow. the Eagles cover, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yep. Uh, and, uh, and, and so he, he was also a, an instrumental in encouraging, encouraging me to continue on. And that was, a, a store that, um, they, they'd have like traditional foods there. You could have soft key there and get your boots worked on and your hat shaped again and <laughs> buy some really classic fine line, um, sixties and seventies, uh, artwork. And, and, uh, so between all those influences, that's kind of what got me into it. So Mary being a motivator, I would think, what motivates uh -huh. you now in your artwork? Well, um, mainly this, that same, um, it, it's, it goes back and forth. Um, I'm, I'm kind of motivated now by, um, just continuing on. It's kind of, kind of too late to change careers now. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, Right now, I'm I'm in Columbus, Georgia, and I'm working with the Columbus Museum here as a um, kind of they're bringing artists. My original homeland is just right up the road. Um, uh, Arbica is is in Alabama, across the river, mm -hmm. Chattahoochee River, just right behind me. I'm pointing through the wall here, like <laughs> you can see it. Uh, and so. It's amazing. I'm the first family member in my immediate family to come back in four generations. Wow. And so uh, to the I've, ancestral I've homeland. Just about, yes, yes. Uh, my ancestral homeland before removal. And so I've been working off and on with classes, the college here. And it's and so I, I do landscapes in the southwest. Mm -hmm. But that's mainly for the marketing side of it. That's mainly to make a living and support my family. But I want to take these landscapes and start painting the mounds. Um, I also work with a lot of prehistoric collections, um, Anasazi pots, right. uh, ancient pots, and I see a lot of the same iconography in the pottery that I do in the relics here. And so I, I, I'm very fascinated by our prehistoric uh, language before there was a written language, uh, and I know that there's correlation between them. Mm -hmm. And I just can't really answer my own questions yet, but I'm fascinated by that. And I think uh, what I've experienced this last week is enough to fire me up for the rest of my career. Oh, perfect. So another hundred yeah. years. Uh, I hope <laughs> another hundred years. <laughs> so what is, um, what defines Daniel McCoy as a Native American artist? Um, well, no, oh, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, I I don't I I don't the self doesn't exist first off and but as an artist I tend to hide behind my paintings always have um I kind of stop doing market shows like Indian Market or mm -hmm. Idol Jorg or any of those because I always felt like I hurt my paintings by doing the salesman tap dance pitch in, in front of them and I like my paintings to just be as they are it's how I record my life. Uh, it's my personal timeline, uh, basically from where I left home. I love the idea that I put these pieces out. I'm just so grateful that somebody will put them in their home or they actually move or they're in a museum collection and they have their own existence. Mm -hmm. And that's that's way more than I could ever do in a physical form as a human. So I really feel like my 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 best cut form of communication is through mark making uh re and i'm a conduit for something else i don't even know what that is but i i'm the conduit and it comes out and um uh, that's that's my goal that's been it from the very get-go and so uh, hopefully that continues on and it just gets more fine-tuned and uh i hope i never realize or come to that epiphany and i just keep working i i do about anywhere from 70 to about a hundred pieces a year. Wow. And so I'm trying to cut up, uh, can continue becoming more prolific. And I try to make every piece be very individual. Um, the landscapes are something else a little different, you know, they mm -hmm. kind of will look a little bit more the same, but the more pop oriented social commentary, those are always completely different. 
I mean, that many pieces of work throughout the year is you're very motivated. <laughs> you haven't lost that. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, a deadline is, is Danny's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in, in doing those pieces uh, throughout the year, is there a goal that you're trying to hit? Do you have a certain goal as being an artist? I, I have a picture in my brain mm -hmm. that I'm trying to reach. and I never, ever quite reach it. Um, and that's that outcome. I'm revealing something about myself, but asking a question at the same time. Uh, a lot of these ideas are something I thought of maybe when I'm a child. So I'm trying, there's a, um, a, a form of innocence I'm trying to reach back to. Um, but also I'm trying to be progressive as much as I possibly can and take this art form. I, I really have a lot of faith in native art. Um, I think some of the forerunners are female artists right now. And, and they're really, and Joan Hill being one of my, probably my biggest influence, she's a Cherokee Creek artist from Muskogee. And, and, um, I got to know her in her later years and, and she just never quit. And, mm. and, you know, that it becomes part of your identity and, uh, I'm trying to leave a timeline for, that's my only imprint. Um, cause it doesn't matter what, who I am or what it mm -hmm. is. It's, it's this message and the art and it's become, um, my goal. That's, that's my goal to leave that imprint. So you I mentioned, this question. no, it does. <laughs> uh, you miss, you met, uh, mentioned a message in your art. So what is the message or the story that you're trying to relate to the audience, um, in your pieces? Well, I do, I do one for myself and that can be whatever view. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I try to stay away from political. I don't believe political art ages very well. It doesn't really have anything to do with any of us. Right. I try to have a human connection, uh, maybe an, an older language. Uh, then there's one, I, then I'll do one for my tribe, uh, which will have a foot in its ancestry, uh, whether that's Potawatomi or Muscogee based. Sometimes I, uh, We'll paint my relations like uh, sometimes it'll be Shoshone um, or or Chimwavy or sometimes. And that's because my kids are tied into these tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it'll be Mawala, Lummi. And so my kids connect me to these other cultures. It's usually romance. And that's kind of how it's been historically, you know, with native tribes. You, right. you connect and you join uh, the females family. And, and so... I feel like I'm just continuing that tradition on of changing, exchanging of ideals and hospitalities. And so that I try to work with those three. And then the last one is for marketing and, and, and survival <laughs> and, Selling and actually goods. trying to make a buck to do this. Right. And it's so hard working in the art world because it's never the same thing twice. Um, what you get used to, it's going to change next month. And exactly. so you have to be versatile. So I work in the arts. Uh, I uh, work in, with several museums on their exhibition crews. And then I'm also um, the program director for the Center of Indigenous and Entrepreneurship at the Poe Cultural Center in Powaki Pueblo. Oh, okay. So I kind of dance around and because <laughs> um, you have to be versatile. And then when things really die down and slow down, I go back to college and throw something on the degree or do some, it, just whatever, right, just right. whatever to keep surrounded by the arts. Because uh, the times I have had a good paying career in management or upper management, I've been totally unfulfilled mm -hmm. yet. You know, we have this lucrative, nice kind of flow of income coming in, but I'll always destroy it with like dynamite to go back to the arts and, and there's that struggle. And I kind of like that push and pull of that lifestyle. I've gotten used to it. Um, I tried to be a musician starting off and I still music still feeds into everything I do. Mm -hmm. Like when I get stumped on an idea, I'll play music for a little bit or play drums or whatever I've got handy in the studio. And the idea comes out of it, but you can definitely live a little bit more comfortable as a painter than you ever could have, uh, as being a musician right, and right. uh so but but it still feeds into uh uh point a to point b you know sure. do you feel you take risk in your pieces or your 
Uh, yes, I do. Yes. I hear not as much lately uh, because I've had to kind of follow a formula that works and work with my gallery a little bit more mm-hmm. and kind of like, oh, okay. Cause I noticed that if I stray too far off, um, it does, I'll end up having the piece for five or 10 years. And then, then I see sometimes I'm ahead of the game. Sometimes I feel like I'm behind the game. Uh, but the pop narrative pieces, those are the ones that are more rewarding to me, uh, where I combine all the influences, but it takes a long time for those to ever get accepted. Mm. So like, you know, most of the museums now, they want stuff I did um, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I couldn't get rid of those back in the day. I, I mean, I was, I is carried there, them everywhere. And, is there a uh, connectivity? Now between, that's what they want. I'm like, yeah. Is there a connectivity <laughs> so between like, what okay. you did 15, 20 years ago to, to today? Do you see a rhythm? Yeah, actually, can... uh, right now I'm, I'm doing a, a commission for Sterling Harjo and he's wanting me to paint something I did 23 years ago <laughs> and I'm doing it in oils. And I, I'm having a really hard time trying to return back to that style. Your mindset I'm too getting, changes. I'm getting the old sp- spirit of it back. <laughs> I mean, you know, my kids have kind of softened my edge and I, my old age a little bit, but um, they're the technique, the line mark making, and it's a constant. There's a constant thread that connects everything, and so there's electricity going back and forth in communication. The right. the, the the can with the wire. I, I can I can still <laughs> hear what I was thinking, and so uh, oh yeah, I'm very connected to what I did uh, all the way from age 15 to age 48. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, lucky yeah. you. <laughs> I, for, I sometimes forget yesterday. So. <laughs> oh, well, I do too. I... <laughs> Is there a certain process you go through when you have something uh, in your mindset or a vision that you want to relay in one of the mediums since you do? It's usually a, 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 the ideas are what base it first. Uh, and I've got a few different processes for that, but it's usually it comes from a discussion. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a movie you saw, but it's an idea I obsess about. You know, when you're doing mundane things and you're letting your mind drift, like folding up clothes or doing the dishes or driving on a long commute, um, there's these ideas or you're in the shower, you start obsessing over these ideas. I'll do that. And if it keeps sticking around for a while, I jot it down. I jot it down in a sketchbook. Maybe do a rough sketch, mm-hmm. and then I'll start the painting. Now, the narrative-based paintings take a little bit longer. Uh, they they take anywhere from just a few days to uh, uh, sometimes a few years. Now, now the landscapes I do now recently, that'll be maybe an area or a mountain or uh, maybe a mesa or maybe a grove of trees or maybe a street scene or whatever it is that I've been – I'm like, oh, I'm I like that, you know. Right. Um, and then I drive by it several times and then I'll go and sketch it. Then with cell phones now I can take a photo. Right. I used to be a terrible <laughs> photographer. And so now I work from photography a little bit more than I ever have done, other than when I was a billboard painter. So um uh but that's that's kind of basic process, but it's it's definitely obsessing thinking things over and over and finally mm-hmm. if it makes it through the big plinko game of art selection um natural selection that's what i go for do you challenge yourself in your in your pieces um if i stick to a formula that works i get after the second or third piece um i get really bored with it and mm-hmm. i can't remember the titles and that's when i <laughs> That's when I know it's time to move on to something else. I can feel stagnant waters coming up and um, for lack of a better metaphor. And that's when I know it's time to push myself again, Mm -hmm. tackle a subject or, 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 or a landscape that I, I, that's difficult. And so with the landscapes, as long as you follow mother nature and its complexity, no matter what your technical skill is, um, it'll, it'll come out doing good. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And and you have to put your own stamp and your own identity on some of these things. And so even if it's not technically what what played out in your mind, you know, still you get the you you get the feeling. And then also, I don't necessarily even though I probably could use going to a psychologist or something, but <laughs> I saw these problems in the painting. Right. Um, and so I'm able to pro, pro, uh, problem solve. That's part of the process. And then I've exercised the demons. And so <laughs> it's it's just a healing. That's how I communicate. It's just a um, a process of healing. Right, now. right. Hmm. Giving back. Right, right. What are some of the, the significant poignant pieces that you've done that you could say you're most proud of or the ones that you were really surprised on the reaction? That's been received. Um, well, I, I did one in 2007. I was just talking to a class about that this morning here in Columbus. And um, I did a piece called Voltron meets Andrew Jackson. Hmm. And I was, um, I was really into the first wave of anime, like Speed Racer and, and Voltron. I remember. Uh, wow. and, and that hit me in the early eighties. And, uh, and micronauts, things like that. I was fascinated by these toys and uh, these cartoons that would come out. And so I told myself that if I ever got good, I'd go back and paint these toys and start putting them into the art. And so me and my brothers were sitting at my grandmother's table and I pulled down this old toy I found in the attic. And it was the Voltron toy I got. And, uh, and that's five lions that form a big robot. Right, right. I just loved it. And um, so Devin and Derek, my brothers, my younger brothers, they said, you should make Voltron fighting Andrew Jackson. And I was like, yes, that's a great idea. And so I had him surprise Voltron surprise Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. It has a lot of slain uh, Red Stick Muscogee Creek warriors there. And, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm just going too far with this. It's it's not it's not going to be accepted. And I put it out there and start putting it in the shows, and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. um, that's one where I felt like I was turning a corner. And the other one was around 2018, uh, where I did a, a landscape called Path to Clarity. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, um, that's uh, that was out taking a stroll with my teenage child. And um, just because I avoided landscapes for 20 years, 20 plus years, because I thought they were a waste of paint. You know, if you if you didn't, they you know, sell good. If it didn't come out with your, what's that? They sell good. They're marketable. If they start. That's that's what I discovered. Right. I didn't want to accept that as a fact when I was younger. And Norman Akers, an Osage artist from Oklahoma, um, he was one of my instructors, painting instructors, and he was said, "Dan, you gotta uh, do do these landscapes." And he showed me his. I was very inspired by his, but. I just could never get with it. And I didn't have any money to really waste my materials on a landscape. And, and, uh, but I had this great epiphany when I was out walking a few years back with my son and that's what kicked it off. And so we use quilting video games, I, I architecture, uh, to go into the background. And then I still use kind of the pop art influences to do the landscape. And it was an inspirational mix. And um, anyway, those once I turned that corner and that was in 2018, 2019, just here recently, it just opened up a whole new world for me. And so I realized that I don't have to stay connected to these tough narratives where you you feel like you're chained to it. A actually, it's more releasing and more of a meditative uh, process. I start at one corner and go to the next and it paints itself. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, I feel very refreshed. And uh, it there, it's a faster technique, but still just as complex. I don't like any solid bare areas. I like every square inch to have bazillions of little things. I used to paint with a magnifying glass. Oh, and wow. then my glasses are just as, you know, <laughs> so um, I get really crazy about it. And I have to kind of hold myself back sometimes and, and develop boundaries. And so those are my, uh, those are two examples. Um, I've got several 
um, epiphanies along the way. But <laughs> those are the two recent ones. What piece have you done that you're surprised you didn't get the reaction or the interpretation of? Um, well, they all eventually get there. But yeah. I did a, a portrait of Chido Harjo in 2008 or 2007 that I just thought was the one of the greatest things I ever did. And Chido Harjo, or Crazy Snake, for mm -hmm. those who don't know, was um, kind of the Robin Hood um, of our tribe. He kind of stole from the rich and gave to the poor um, an activist for the people before there was activist. Right. And um, anyway, uh, I did a portrait of him and I thought, oh, man, this is going to this is going to do good. And it just fell flat on its face. And but lo and behold, you have to wait 10 years. And sometimes things can take a while. And I've mm -hmm. learned to not think about now. Uh, and that comes from all different kinds of sources, not to become too critical on yourself that eventually as long as you put your mind to it and you have good intentions, the piece usually gets where it's supposed to go. And that's what I mean by these paintings having their own life to them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just being patient with the idea. I think good art takes time. If you have instant success and it's all too much shake and bake or too much instant oatmeal, uh, that's that's when you got to kind of worry. You got like, oh, it's it's just a product of its moment, and um, I kind of like it when it takes a long time for it to get where it's going. And so, because I'm not in no hurry, I'm I'm not going anywhere, and and uh, you know, I I I'm I kind of work at a slower pace now, as far as letting these things go out mm -hmm. and being seen. But you still have to put them out there. You know, you could be the greatest artist the greatest uh, you know baker what whatever you're doing and, and unless you go out and share it with folks you're not gonna you're not gonna even get anywhere so correct correct it, that's kind of i like to save certain pieces for the back burner sometimes if they're not ready at least i do now <laughs> so now that you've relocated in your the ancestral homeland have you seen that your perspective or your your output from your surroundings has changed? Well, I haven't relocated, but I am thinking about being a snowbird. Yeah. Um, uh, this was, um, this is a, uh, something we've been working on for about six, seven years. Uh, so it's uh, the pandemic slowed all that down with all museums getting shut down. Correct. Uh, so now really for only about a year, we've been kind of sticking our head out of the cave, so to speak. And uh, doing shows in person more. And so this is something I've always wanted to do. But I'm glad that I put it off until now because I always would drive through Georgia on my way to Florida. My oldest son, Roman, grew up in this area, uh, grew up in uh, Hollywood, Florida and um, uh, Big Cypress Reservation and those areas. Mm -hmm. And so I would just zigzag and I never stopped. I always wanted to. Uh, but now um, I see its worth. It, it was snowing last Friday a week wow. ago in Santa Fe. So to come back here and see the, all the green and uh, and see the warmth, and um, I'm just loving it. So hopefully <laughs> this will be something. And and I have other cousins that are coming back here as well, so I won't be alone. And uh, we're all rediscovering. And I think uh, I know this word trauma is used for everything nowadays. But we're putting past um, the trauma that our grandparents and great grandparents held for this area, and I can see what it is being outside of the box. And and um, so I know there'll be some sort of something that comes, and 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 that's um, my goal from the very get go with these landscapes was to take it from the southwest mm -hmm. and then attempt to start recording the mounds, these sacred areas, in just a different way. And it's hard to sell a green landscape. Uh, green and blue don't go as together as well as brown and blue. Right, and right. Uh, I just kind of want to slowly but surely guide it to these areas. And that's that's part of that recording, leaving an imprint uh, after I'm gone kind of stuff. So since you've been I doing this. I hope that answers the question. Oh, no, it does. Yeah. 
Uh, since you've been okay. <laughs> since you've been doing this for some time now, do you have current influencers that you look at or are influencing you in your pieces or that you look to? Uh, well, I'd say my kids are starting to. They're all yeah. they're all artists in their own right. And uh, my two youngest are hoop dancers. Okay. Um, they they dance with the Lightning Boy Foundation, and hoop dancing originated in kind of in the Taos area. And uh, I didn't know that. I I, I knew one, um, and uh, that was Arapaho. Mm. Uh, and I just thought there was one hoop dancer. And so my kids are healing me. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, we lost uh, 36 family members wow. in, in Oklahoma. And uh, it really went through our family for various reasons. And I won't get into that. And um, it, it affected my life because comp- uh, we lost elders that were irreplaceable. Yeah. People that had went to prison or to Vietnam. And then for this to come through and wham, they're gone. Um it it changed my feeling of mourning. It changed um, my process of mourning, and mm-hmm. and it made me feel like I could never go back home ever. And so my kids regressed because we were homeschooling them in their own various ways. And the hoop dancing has brought that back. It's a it's a dance to uh, heal those who can't dance anymore. And so that's one reason. Um, I also have a great extended family full of photographers, potters. My wife is a sculptor and a really good painter in her own right, way better than me, in my personal opinion. Get and her on so, the show. <laughs> huh? I said, get her on the show. <laughs> I will. I'll hit her up. And um, and so I get. I have this great support group. And then also working at museums like Site Santa Fe as – part of their paint crew Mm -hmm. and exhibitions crew, we set up the work by these artists that maybe they don't want that to be known, but I like to think we're a group of super friends and we all have a certain power we do. And um, everybody on this exhibitions crew uh, are great artists in their own right. So I feel like finally I've reached a point where I'm in this community. That's just fantastic. Um, and I just constantly bounce off ideas from inspiration, but there's the times where you get to go see a show and you're struck by lightning by something, whatever that is. And there's this whole new younger generation I'm meeting that are just in their early twenties and teens that are just doing amazing things. And so I, you know, Mary Adair, my high school teacher Mm -hmm. was she kind of gave me this sense of urgency, like, oh, this native art, it's going to be disappearing. And I don't believe that at all now. I think it's going to keep going on and on Absolutely. and it's going to morph into something. It, it's 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 always been a force to be reckoned with, but now it's just going to keep changing. And it's going to be a reflective conduit um, for what's going on outside. And so it, it'll be it'll be continuing that exchange of ideas. I mean, I want to know who won Indian market in the, in the nine hundreds, you know, because it's been going on then, you know, and this creative kind of competition. Oh, you did this. Okay. Right. Well, let me do this. It's an, ex- it's a language we're speaking. And that's, that's, that language isn't going to die out. No, it's, it's our continuing story going. as well. I mean, we're, yes. we're evolving yes. as a culture and a people. So that story is going to, continue forward for generations and generations. Absolutely. So what's on the horizon for, for you as a native American artist? Well, we have, um, right when I get back, I have one more week here in Georgia. Uh, and so we will be, uh, uh, work. I'll start on my summer show, which is Mm -hmm. usually held up during Indian market, maybe a week or so beforehand. At Echo Gallery, that's with a H in Santa Fe, and so I'll get started on that. And those are usually uh, uh, it'll start with some influence from here. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm here w- working with the Museum of Columbus uh, uh, to produce a mural at the entrance of their museum in fall of 2024. Uh, there's some projects going on with the various museums I work with. Um, uh, 
I'll be helping open um, kind of a local gallery that promotes the local potters back home, and I learn about their designs. So I enjoy presenting other people's artwork just as much as my own or my family's. Uh, so we have all that. Uh, there's a show with Jean Quick to See Smith that she's curating that'll be in New Jersey coming up. Um, and then we might, there might be a possibility of me uh, working with the Jeffrey Gibson team uh, coming up for the uh, Venice Biennale, uh, Biennale in um, Italy. Mm, wow. uh, so uh, the whole next couple of years are booked. And then there's all kinds of little things that pop up. Um, I'm doing an album cover for. Um, a local band in Albuquerque called Hank and the Huckleberries. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so there's all kinds of cool projects going on. And hopefully there's a lot of little surprises. I try not to book too much. Right. Because it'll you all end know. up train wrecking for lack of a better term. Yeah. And so I, I, but that's, that's what's up on the top of my mind. Also a show at Rainmaker Gallery in Bristol, England. If I can get the work done, sorry, Joanne. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's there's lots of things and my paintings get to travel sometimes i don't get to travel with them unfortunately but we have that and then hopefully um i'll be traveling to ireland to go find my namesake too with the family so we're, i'm i'm starting to have time to open up to these new um you have lots uh, on the horizon cultural, <laughs> yeah lots, lots of old cultural possibilities have been putting off right so yeah fantastic so if there's any one piece that you could say is the essence, the epitome of who you are as an artist, what piece would that be? Or two, you can go to two. Um, it would, it uh, would, it either be the amazing couch or summertime blues, which I did probably about 16, 17 years ago. Both and, pieces uh, I can ago? provide, I can send images yeah. uh, for these after this interview for you guys. And, and, and those were pieces where I will take, a serious subject matter or in a lighthearted subject matter and use surrealism, the, uh, the, the fine line techniques and, and mishmash them all together. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I feel like when I kind of started finding my ground, um, there's uh, a piece in the Institute of American Indian arts collection called early independence. It's a triptych. I think that one is, um, epitomizes kind of, what I was going for also a piece called the great chain of being um, uh, that's a diptych. When I really put the philosophy and let the idea stew and then take a long time to produce the pieces, that's when they come out the best. And then um, uh, what's the other one? Um, uh, Southwestern sunset. That's another uh, has these big swirly pink pieces. It's kind of by Pouillet Cliffs on mm. the other side of Santa Clara Pueblo. Those are the few I'm I'm very proud of. I'm very. I felt like a ooh, did that come out of me? <laughs> you know, kind of. I I was like, man, Who did that. That's when the yeah. idea works. But those moments are few and far between. Um, I'm always trying to catch up to my brain. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is do you like to collaborate? Have you ever collaborated with other artists on pieces? I tried to be a collaborative artist. Um, there was this uh, group called The Humble that my wife participated with, and that was a Santa Fe collective. And they would just, it was kind of graffiti-ish, kind of street art, but they also broke down the parameters of uh, presentation. And so um, they would do one piece and hand it to the other. Mm -hmm. And then by the time 15 people had done it, here is this amazing thing. So I tried to get with that and it didn't work out as well. People would give me pieces and I keep them for five years, <laughs> but eventually it works out. So I've done several collaborations with Hoka Skin Skinador, Jameson Chase Banks. I do collaborations with my wife, Topaz Jones, very well. She's probably the best because we're in the same, under the same roof. Um, I've done stuff with my oldest son, Roman. Uh, I've done murals with my teenage son, Levon, mm. I mean, Noel. And um, I hope that just continues. It becomes kind of this family thing. Uh, so, yes, I, I can do it, but I'm not as fast. 
Since you're a multifaceted and work in various mediums, is there something that you haven't done yet that you want to put your mind to? Uh, I'd like to get uh, into three-dimensional sculpture more, maybe using forms of polyurethane. Uh, maybe go back to automotive painting where I'm kind of using those old techniques like I used to in the commercial art days. Um, but I don't know what that would be, some sort of shape steel. But it's it's still it's still pushing pigment around on a surface. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to get back into other forms, especially something more three dimensional. Uh, but it'll, it'll always be something to put paint on, whatever that is. Fantastic. So you mentioned your wife and your kids. So you have a very uh, collective group of artists in your family. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have um, an older son who's 29, uh, Roman, and he's a street artist, uh, a graffiti artist, and just kind of a lover of life. And so he kind of does all the free things that I would always wanted to do. Right. And so I collaborate with him from time to time. I wish I, uh, if, uh, if he hears this, I wish he was, he would come back and we would uh, work a little bit more. He doesn't know it, but I put some of his paintings in galleries. He's shown in New York and doesn't know it. Wow. Uh, so uh, there, <laughs> there, now, I do maybe. stuff like that. <laughs> um, then my teenage son, who is uh, training to be an opera singer, I tell him to do that gig first. Uh, is his his uh, his mother is a photographer, um, and his dad is a renowned potter in mm -hmm. the area. And so he's already gone to art school, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, and and he's really good on his own. I hope to be working on a comic with him and wrapping that up. Maybe more fanzine kind of mm. stuff. Uh, I used to do a lot of fanzines for uh, underground music when I was a teenager and in my 20s and played music. And then my daughter does digital work and animation. She's taught herself. And she's amazing on it. Um, and then I've yet to see what my youngest boy, who's uh, um, and my daughter's eleven, and my my youngest son's nine, and so they're all doing something. And so on Sundays, we uh, get at the kitchen table, huddle together, and come up with stuff. And I can just see it all forming. Wow. So uh, I wish one of them would grow up to be a doctor or something, but <laughs> I think I'm going to have a group of artists. <laughs> so it's it's not about me anymore. It's about us. Right. And that's that communal spirit. Um, and, I hope, and they all play music in their own way. And so hopefully we take it back to the porch and um, maybe turn off the TV and the devices a little bit more. And so oops, sorry about that. Shook the oh, table um, and start playing some music more right. more often. What do you feel defines a Native American artist? Oh, well, I think it's it's exactly what we're talking about. It's um, seeing something, embracing it, and then from whatever medium it is, it can be anything, and and just putting that culture in. You got to watch about, you know, I've seen a lot of artists that get up there and uh, they get what I call the big the big pluffy cape. <laughs> and they get off track. They don't know what's – they don't even know how to look at their own art. And I've worked for a lot of these artists like this. And that – and you can be tempted by the fame and the money that gets thrown your way. And once that happens, I see that you can kind of – it's kind of a door you cross through and you can never go back. And so I've worked for some people that I grew up thinking, oh, these are the greatest artists. And – and once I work for them and be their assistant for a while, I get really kind of uh, uh, frustrated and just kind of run out of steam with some of these artists by how shallow they are. Mm. And um, I think once you get past this point, uh, you, you can never go back to innocence. And so I, I kind of always try to stay hungry in some sort of process. Yeah, it'd be great to sell a fifty, sixty thousand dollar painting, but it's kind of embarrassing too, you know, Ugh, mm. I got away with that. I'm, I'm doing this. And so, um, I kind of try to always keep that in mind, keep a, a, cause the artists that influenced me were just people that did it selfishly to help out the village, help out the community, wherever that was. And so I try to maintain a bit of that innocence. 
and always keep that in mind. Not, mm -hmm. not, not go buy the fancy Italian shoes. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> I'm looking at my boots. I don't have them. That's, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, me neither. I got vans on. <laughs> so since you have children that are actually pursuing those endeavors in the artistic world, do you like to mentor? Um, When they ask for it, usually yeah. they can care less if I say something. <laughs> uh, it's more or less about sitting at the table. And sometimes they'll let me play some good music, uh, but sometimes I'll listen to their music. Mm. Uh, sometimes I watch their shows that they're trying to show me. Sometimes I try to copy how they draw. And uh, um, I, I mentor as much as my, my my wife's a lot better at it. She's a lot better in getting through to them. Um, I I do my best. And I hopefully, hopefully maybe the image alone will be enough communication to get to them. But they're allowed to use any of my materials, mm -hmm. you know, so... I make sure that, and, and the thing is with children, if you just surround them with the arts, it's like that osmosis, you know, water, hot water into the hard bean, it, it breathes life into it, you know? It finds and its I'm way. I'm not calling my kids a bunch of pinto beans, but that's, that's <laughs> kind of how I look at it. So as an artist, what would you tell someone that is battling the direction of becoming an artist because of all the, I guess the, um, the outlook or the, what people look as artists like, Oh, it's going to take a lot. It's, there's going to be a lot of struggle. You could be a starving artist. What would you say to someone that's saying, well, I can really paint. I could really draw. I could really sculpt and work with clay, well, but. I, I saw a group of kids this morning here in Columbus mm -hmm. that just, they were just full of talent, just waiting. They're same age as my kids, just waiting to get out there and make their mark on the world, whatever that is. And I, I told them to just be patient. Sometimes the things that you want when you're 15 or 16, maybe they're not going to come to you or appear until you were like like 48, you know, right. or, you know, in your 50s. And you just learn to grab the reins of whatever vehicle you're driving, whatever your transport is. Grab the reins and control your destiny. Uh, life starts now. Not, it's not going to be tomorrow. And just start thinking about it. You know, open your mind up to these possibilities. And as, if you're stubborn, that's the only reason why I haven't quit, is that there's nothing else I can really do. Um, <laughs> I've tried several other different jobs, and I've crashed and burned. I was, I was the worst cook ever, you know. When was the defining um, I, I was moment? I the worst waiter ever. <clears throat> Huh? When was the def when was the defining moment for you that you knew you were an artist? Um, when I was, oh, I'd say uh, when I was twenty four and going back to yeah. college, I'd been a commercial painter. From I lied about my age to get the job, <laughs> and uh, 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 yeah, I worked with some older guys in Tulsa, and they kind of taught me everything, and then. Uh, once, once I learned, cause I crashed and burned in art school the first time and had to go back and my son was going to be born. That was 30 years ago now. And, uh, you know, you know, I worked for, at, at the sign shop and we painted everything from buses, television, backdrops, theater, billboards, everything. It, that taught me everything that, um, uh, Art school didn't teach, mm. you know, and then once I went back at 25, I realized, hey, this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, my like minded friends were there. And now, you know, my whole life has been formed around that. And so it's um, what was it? Uh, Funkadelic, right? Funkadelic right. records. Yeah, George yeah. Clinton. Uh, free your mind and your ass will follow. Right. And that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of the metaphor I've got here. Pardon me for saying potty words, <laughs> no but, uh, <laughs> but that's kind of it. That's and and uh, um, that's kind of my philosophy. <laughs> Do you think every artist has to go through the star starving artist phase? Oh yeah, you if yeah. that's what I mean. If you if you're too much right out of the can and and you're good, you know, 
that means there's probably some superficial qualities like, oh, maybe uh, maybe you're a little too good looking, you know. <laughs> maybe there's too much external stuff going on. Right. Uh, I I if you're if you got to stay hungry if you're going to make good art. The second um the second you're not that hungry anymore. Maybe that's when things start getting kind of watered down. You need to put more Kool-Aid in the picture, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that's how I look at it. And I constantly, maybe I'm my own worst enemy, but I have to always pull myself back and take a rest. Uh, other than that, the work gets very transparent and loses its meaning. So in your next phase, let's say the next 20 years, do you see yourself continuing on the same path and being being able to self reflect and saying, okay, when I started at this age and now I'm 20 years, what would you be 70 or something? I'm still the same. My perspective, my DNA is still being outputted into my pieces. Oh yeah. Um, I feel as I'm getting older, I'm getting back to that original idea. Um, and that's that's where I'll go with, you know, painting robots I like in the 80s, you know, and putting them into something now. Mm -hmm. uh, but this this experience here in Georgia, I feel like I'm, I've kind of found out what I'm going to do for the next 20, 30 years. I hope I make it that long. Um, I used to not think I was going to make it past 25. I uh, hear you, but I did. <laughs> I, 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 I did yeah. it. I, I I've I've fallen down some steps and taken <laughs> a lot of good good uh, hiccups and here and there, but We've I'm bumped still our head at a few it. times, I, I'm sure. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. They, that's why I got my hat on to hide the bumps. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, uh, I, I I think I'm going to continue on because I, I really can't do much else. I I hope I become a little bit more competent as a musician, and I'm starting to do more performance based art. Right. And move that into with the painting. Uh, so hopefully that'll grow. Um, I have an interest in our traditional musics, our church musics that uh, was kind of inspired by Scottish Highland artists. And then also my own love for historical music. I want to tie that in with the art somehow a little bit more. I don't know what that is. Um, hopefully that idea comes to me through a little bit more maturity. Mm. So. That's my goal. I just want to keep on the path. And, and um, this southeastern area of the country is kind of the one area I haven't tapped. And so that's the and up, up, up and down the Mississippi. So right. uh, there's slowly but surely it's approaching. And uh, and just kind of answer all the questions that I've always had. And I, I was, excuse me, I'm right by a really busy street. So no worries. there's some loud car <laughs> stereos going by. Sorry about that. So um, what, where can people, this is your time to plug. Where can people find your artwork? All right. I, I'm exclusively at Echo Gallery. Um, I do uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's on uh, West Palace Avenue. I can't remember the number. Sorry, Frank. Uh, but you can uh, look up. Echo Gallery, that's H-E-C-H-O. Um, that's primarily where you see my work. Um, and then um, I'm from time to time, at, I'm at David Richard Gallery in, in New York. Hopefully we'll have another show coming up. And, um, and in various museum shows that are sp spontaneous. But right now, that's the, that's the main hub, Santa Fe. That's the gist of it. Uh, hopefully Oklahoma. Oklahomans, if you're listening. Um, I'm trying to find a good spot, a good home to land out there and, and represent um, because I've but that's the thing. I've never really been embraced by uh, Oklahoma very much. It's a diff definite mark, different market mm -hmm. than Santa Fe. And I always had a hard time uh, finding my right spot. So I'm still trying to find a good place out there. And we'll so help, we can help uh, you but, get there. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, Thanks. <laughs> any uh, closing words of wisdom? Um, uh, I'm so glad we finally got to um, get this together, and yeah. for all of you to keep painting and 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 keep sculpting, keep beating, whatever you do, keep dancing, uh, keep creating. Um, uh, you know um, what we do now. Our our children and the generations uh, next. 
will be using, will be influencing them. And so uh, I want to thank, uh, um, thank you for uh, being persistent. And, uh, <laughs> and that way we finally got a good podcast going and good connections and all that. I'm so yeah. pleased. So uh, 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 Mado, big Mado to all my, my friends and family out there. Well, Daniel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm thoroughly thrilled to have you on the show and, and the time that you've spent with us today. Oh, oh, it's my pleasure. Pleasure's Thank all you, mine. Thank you very much, Thank sir. Thank you very much. Have a good one. All right. Okay, you too. <laughs>